Chapter 1. The Convergence of Two Outliers from Seemingly Parallel Backgrounds Adam Newman was not born with the brash self-assurance he's had since high school. He was the son of Avivit and Doran Newman, two doctors who met while studying medicine at Ben Gurion University. Doran went into ophthalmology while Avivit became an oncologist. They married in 1978 and Avivit gave birth to Adam in the desert city of Beersheba a year later, when she was 22. Avivit and Doran split two weeks before their 10th wedding anniversary, and Adam subsequently said their divorce marked the most difficult time of his life. As his mother dragged Adam and Addie, his younger sister, to various residences, he grew resentful of her. The three Newmans moved to Indianapolis shortly after the couple divorced, where Avivit completed her medical residency. At an already challenging period, young Adam Newman struggled to adapt to a new environment and a new country where he didn't speak the language. The American government even attempted striking the final N from his family's surname. Avivit described her son as falling apart. In 1990, the Newmans returned to Israel after two years in Indiana to live in Nur Am, a tiny village a mile from the Gaza Strip, in a stony desert dotted with date palms and pomegranate bushes. Nir Am is a kibbutz, one of the visionary communities that first identified themselves via a blend of socialism and Zionism and had sprouted up in Israel during the previous decades to construct self-sustaining colonies throughout the country. Miguel McKelvey, like Newman, grew up under unique circumstances. In the 1960s, his mother, Lucia, lived in Taos, New Mexico, when she and her three friends became mothers simultaneously. According to McKelvey, the fathers left one after the other, and the newly single moms formed a matriarchal collective. They lived apart while raising their children together and discovered ways to survive outside traditional social structures and expectations. McKelvey went on to the University of Oregon to study architecture, graduating with a 4.0 GPA. Keep in mind, bringing people together seems thrilling and perhaps lucrative. After all, employees are increasingly seeking physical interaction in this digital age. WeWork's co-founders' upbringing and life experiences served as crucial spurs in the company's development. Are you in charge of a firm or planning to launch one? You can learn from the highs and lows of the WeWork founders. Chapter 2. How the WeWork Flames Were Ignited from the Humble Beginnings of Green Desk McKelvey was in Brooklyn working for the architectural firm JPDA when he decided to take the subway to Tribeca. He was in town to see Gil Hackley, an Israeli architect who also worked at JPDA. McKelvey was followed into the elevator at Hackley's building by a man who made his presence known by his height, loudness of speech, and lack of a shirt and shoes. Even though it was a hot summer day in New York, this seemed odd. The strange man turned out to be Hackley's roommate, Adam Newman. Coincidentally, Newman had started an infant clothing firm before meeting his prospective partner and had recently moved it from a warehouse to a shop at 68 J Street in Brooklyn, in the same building where McKelvey's architecture practice was located. Newman's clothing business was ailing at the time. McKelvey also felt he was wasting away building another's empire. Due to their mutual acquaintance, Hackley, and frequent interactions from working in the same building, Newman and McKelvey started exchanging ideas. Before long, they decided to collaborate on a venture while Newman continued struggling to keep the clothing firm afloat. The new firm was a niche replication of what McKelvey was doing at JPDA. They were looking at leasing out shared office spaces. Unfortunately, they had no properties of their own. While brainstorming on working around this bottleneck, Newman remembered spotting unoccupied floors in the 68 J Street building and approached the landlord, Joshua Gutman. Newman tabled the proposal of making just one of the vacant floors under renovation into an office suite company. Gutman first declined Newman's proposition, but he persisted until the former agreed to show him another building that he had acquired nearby. When Gutman eventually approved, it came with a clause that proceeds from leasing out the spaces would be shared between himself and Newman. Next, Gutman instructed him to submit a formal business strategy which inspired Newman to track down McKelvey and inform him what had transpired. WeWork viewed itself as a physical network, the largest globally, and identified its customers as members. Gutman agreed to remodel the facility, while Newman and McKelvey contributed $5,000 to begin construction. Newman continued to maintain his infant clothing company while McKelvey dedicated himself full-time to the new company, Green Desk. Hackley later enlisted as a third partner. Chapter 3. 
WeWork hit the ground running, and the founders grabbed every loose hand they could reach. After making exponential returns on their investments in Greendesk, Newman, McKelvey, and Hackley eventually sold their Greendesk holdings to Gutman in 2009. Each of the three co-founders received around half a million dollars, paid out over several years. While Hackley returned to Israel, Newman and McKelvey decided to put the money into a new business as equal partners, calling it WeWork. However, probably due to McKelvey's introverted personality, Newman was before long talking and acting like the substantive owner of WeWork. Newman and McKelvey met Joel Schreiber, a young but well-established real estate entrepreneur, while looking for WeWork's first building. Although Schreiber had no building to give the duo at the moment, he became enamored with Newman's passion and bought into WeWork's concept. After his initial meeting with the two founders, Schreiber agreed to invest $15 million in WeWork, an arbitrary, non-existent firm. Newman's bombast perplexed many of WeWork's early workers. The offices of WeWork were lovely, but initially hardly qualified as a revolution. Despite this, the community-building goal Newman preached was what drew many of them away from good but uninteresting careers. WeWork didn't provide large salaries or stock options, their key recruiting strategy like other tech startups. Danny Orenstein was a notable piece of WeWork's rapidly growing team. Orenstein was McKelvey's high school classmate, practiced law in Oregon, and functioned as the firm's general counsel, allowing them to utilize his ESC. On their official documentation, Chia O'Keefe Sally, McKelvey's fraternal sister from Georgia, also joined assisting WeWork with opening its first location outside of New York in San Francisco. Marga Snyder, a former Iroquois hotel concierge, agreed to manage the company's events, and Joey Cables, a high school student, was their first IT director. Working at a startup is anything but fun. However, you have a sense of belonging, of contributing to some potentially great cause. Newman was involved in every aspect of WeWork's operations, insisting on approving the layouts of each new location. Still, he spent much of his time assuming the position of CEO, laying out a strategy for the firm and courting possible partners. He was already gaining a reputation in New York for pouring shots during meetings, initially vodka, then tequila. McKelvey kept WeWork grounded while Newman was a business mystic and dealmaker. Chapter 4. Growth, Revolution, Religion, and the Transformation of the WeWork Landscape Factories were born during the Industrial Revolution, and the enormous production floors championed by Frederick Taylor, a mechanical engineer, were the first open-plan offices. The first white-collar workplaces resembled an assembly line when they initially appeared in the 20th century. Johnson Wax Headquarters, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1939, had better lighting and a more personal touch. Cubicles were popular in the 1980s alongside the desktop computer providing workers with a bit more privacy and dominating the workplace, until Silicon Valley startups began tearing down walls. Instead, these revolutionary companies hired laptop-enabled staff and provided them with beanbag seats and foosball tables. Keep in mind, almost every generation modifies the constitution of the office that meets their requirements. Not only did competitors and other co-working operators lack Newman's desire, but they also lacked his financial connections. Joel Schreiber had only delivered a fraction of his promised investment. He never obtained his entire 33% stake. However, Newman had been able to rely on Schreiber's well-connected circle of acquaintances in the city since the money bag partner caught the vision. Newman rented a property in the Hamptons in the summer of 2011, informing his staff that it was a bit of a stretch financially, but that it was beneficial to impress and develop relationships with wealthy New Yorkers. By 2012, Newman had amassed approximately $7 million in personal funds from friends and family. During her time in Los Angeles, Rebecca Newman, Adam's wife, had followed her cousin Gwyneth Paltrow into Kabbalah. The Kabbalah was a hierarchical institution that favored celebrities and the rich, and frequently placed the Newmans at the top table next to Aiton Yardini, the rabbi, who spent time with many of Kabbalah's VIPs during Friday meals. Newman has an endless faith in his ability to convince people to do things he wants them to do. Miguel McKelvey Newman had never felt particularly connected to religion growing up in Israel. His parents didn't celebrate Jewish festivals or keep Shabbat. He considered observant Judaism a nuance that prevented him from going to the beach on Saturdays since the buses weren't operating. 
Nevertheless, Kabbalah provided structure, purpose, and a way of perceiving the world as his decade of futile trying in New York ended. Chapter 5 The Canker of Adam Newman's Personality, Dysfunction, and Ego The expenses of WeWork's expansion, according to Newman, were a basic problem with a simple answer. He informed potential investors that WeWork could grow at whatever rate they wanted, as long as they were prepared to fund it. Demand for its offices were so high that the only limit to its expansion was the amount of money it could spend on new ones. SoftBank, a Japanese corporation with a minor venture capital arm in the United States, was one company that contemplated investing. One of SoftBank's New York-based investors proposed WeWork as the type of firm on which the company's founder, Masayoshi-san, may wish to put one of his huge bets. SoftBank would later become a heavy investor in WeWork. Adam Newman is WeWork. He's one quarter crazy, one quarter brilliant, and the other half is a fight between his ego and genuinely caring for people. Francis Lobo After the $10 billion Series E round, Newman told the Wall Street Journal that WeWork was profitable, that it wouldn't need any more funding before an IPO, and that it had met or exceeded all its growth projections, but he couldn't go into details. None of the claims turned out to be true. WeWork wasn't a public business, and Newman had complete authority over the board of directors, so there wasn't much stopping him from saying or doing anything he wanted. Remember, a good salesman needs some ego, but an oversized one found in leadership can derail an organization. WeWork secured a landmark deal with The Guardian, a British publication, shortly after this era. WeWork had to share 222 Broadway with The Guardian for a few months while WeWork was renovating their sixth headquarters. On one occasion, after securing a new agreement, Newman addressed WeWork employees at 222 Broadway, where there was free wine and loud music, to the annoyance of the Guardian employees on the next floor. This specific event was so serious that it nearly devolved into a fist brawl between employees of the two organizations, with Newman cheering for his team. Newman later explained that it was during this time that he started to have issues with his ego. Even when he didn't have anything to brag about, it had always been strong. But he had every right to brag now. Chapter 6 As the WeWork roller coaster went down the slide, Newman was required to disembark. WeWork remained Newman's firm, regardless of how much control he delegated to McKelvey, Artie, or anyone else. Everything at WeWork revolved around him, and the charisma he used to entice investors had a similar impact on the company's workers. Newman was a brilliant orator who dominated a room with his physical stature. When Newman looks at you, it's what I imagine it feels like to have Julius Caesar stare at you. There's an intensity, a self-understanding, a belief. Elena Anderson Employees noticed that there was a WeWork life cycle. For six to nine months, recruits would arrive buzzing with anticipation. But the excitement would start to gradually decline until they reached the 18-month mark. At that point, they'd be wary and disillusioned, and anything like the company's meat prohibition would send them over the brink. Those employees would depart, WeWork would replace them, and the cycle would continue. Many employees perceived WeWork as more of a cult than a company. Newman was enthusiastic enough to vacation in Hawaii in the autumn of 2018, anticipating a $20 billion investment dubbed Project Fortitude from SoftBank, WeWork's largest investor. WeWork aimed to launch 79 new sites in December, more than it had in its first six years including its brand-new Salesforce Tower headquarters, which had panoramic views of San Francisco. Even though a One World Trade Center proposal had fallen through, WeWork had surpassed J.P. Morgan as New York City's largest tenant. In 2018, criticisms started emerging from various quarters regarding the management style and unbridled personal expenses. Wingspan, Rebecca Newman's epigraph, unveiled similar issues. The scandal was the Achilles heel that prevented WeWork's IPO from going public and forced Newman to resign from his role as WeWork's CEO. Newman didn't know what to do now that he'd been fired from the work he'd put his heart and soul into for more than a decade. According to Vanity Fair, he took up residence in Gramercy, where he set a note on his desk to remind him of three things he intended to learn from his ordeal. Listen, always arrive on time, be a decent coworker. Did you know? According to Tech Jury, despite its recent financial crisis and with revenue of nearly $3.81 billion in 2020, WeWork was still going strong. Conclusion WeWork's problem was that its greatest strengths, as well as its worst shortcomings, emanated from the top. 
Newman is a superb seller, and the cult of personality around him was what kept the WeWork machine running. But it was the only thing that kept everyone silent. Newman's vision and his promises to investors, landlords, and workers were what was powering WeWork. WeWork's rise didn't shock Schwartz, who had spent part of his career in finance. This was how the system worked. Adam had persuaded one investor after another to believe in his vision. Reeves Wiedemann. Newman had created the ideal venture for the decade, filling acres of unoccupied real estate with armies of budding freelancers. He would then try persuading large corporations that they wanted in on this communal spirit. Newman did all these while embracing the global capital glut that allowed anyone with a dream and some guts to try their hand at building a behemoth. After a decade of prosperity, however, a force greater than his personality arose, revealing the company's core contradiction all along. It was difficult to determine what lesson Newman or future entrepreneurs should take from his ascent and collapse. There were cautionary tales about the types of conduct that contemporary capitalism rewards, the venture capital ecosystem's excess and narrow-mindedness, as well as age-old cautions about the pitfalls of arrogance. However, there was a pattern for a specific type of success. As a test, one famous Silicon Valley venture, Financier, proceeded to ask startup founders what they thought about Newman. The ideal response was to acknowledge his flaws while applauding what he had accomplished. Try this. Everyone is in pursuit of excellence and success. However, even the few that arrive at the top sometimes lose footing due to a lack of success management. Are you a budding or accomplished entrepreneur? While success requires some daring, endeavor to have cautious assertiveness and surround yourself with partners or subordinates that will check you whenever you fall out of line.